like the Holly, that Hollywood church, whatever they are, the scientists. Uh, not not in theology, but in wealth and who they they attracted uh, very elite. Um, in fact, they built this church during the Depression. And they, yeah. kept, they kept paying um, the workers and kept them going through the whole Depression. So they were the kind of folks that had money and could, could afford it. Um, plus, I, you know, the, the stones and everything, I think, were all imported. So, so it's like, you know, this is just an example of an incredible expense, which, notice, hardly anyone's there. You can, of course, go see it. Um, one thing, I don't know if it showed yet, but if you see the, um, the front, the altar is a copy of the Ark of the Covenant. So it's all gold and shaped the way the Bible describes the Ark of the Covenant. But the windows up on top of the altar is uh, stained glass windows of Swedenborg, who believed he was Jesus in the second coming. So, and like all the all the pictures along the way are, are and the main house is a museum of religious artifacts. The millionaires that built the house were into collecting religious art and they traveled all over the world and so they've got all these like Egyptian things and um, there is a college there too, Grinathan, which is Welsh, by the way. B R Y N is a, a Welsh like a stream or something. And Athen is the stream. I don't know much about the theology, but there it is. See, there's like golden angels there, and that's the the ark. That's just kind of interesting. It's an altarpiece that had that. Oh, and I should have. I don't know if you can see the stained glass is harder to film because lights come. So I've got lots of, this is outside on the grounds. The, so the Carnwood Estate was the very first one, and it's no longer the main house anymore because it's been outdone by a much bigger one. But um, you couldn't go in that one as far as I recall. It was, um, this, is, this is the main house where you could actually go in. Believe it or not, that's the house. So. The, car, the old one was closed. I guess that was mostly just used as offices or, or who knows. Maybe that's where the family lived, actually. I don't know. Just kind of impressive. Considering it's a church, not very big um, population-wise. <laughs> Christian, but it's 
Swedenborg is Jesus in the second coming. That's just about as far as I have learned. Even though they gave me all their books, <laughs> I packed them in the suitcase. They're in my garage somewhere. I don't know where. Um, that's one of the reasons why I could never even think about pulling my car into the garage, let alone changing my snow tires in the, in the garage. That would just not, not work. Um, but uh, how how many folks are in it? Uh, as you can see, not very many. So it's not, not populated very, very well. And yet, they're very rich, so if you want to join a church that pretty much pays for itself, there you go. Okay. But so, William James. I'll start with him, even though he's not really the first one. Uh, okay, Wikipedia. So 1842, I, I was for some reason thinking it was 1840, but either way, 1842, 1910. So altogether, we're looking at what, not quite 70 years, 68 years. So I'll pass them next year. Brother Wood. Thank you. Keeps up. Although I'm absolutely convinced I'm living on borrowed time. <laughs> Because I'm at the point now where medicines keep me alive. Does that make sense? So had it not been for modern medicines, my heart, and my cholesterol, and who knows what, every, you know, who knows. But I do keep walking, so I'm walking with the dog, because the dog insists. And so hopefully that will keep me alive. That's, that's what I've heard. As long as you're walking every day, you should, you know, be okay. I guess, I've got to keep the engine running. Um, <clears throat> um, but he was sick all his life, actually. He was, he was one of those, those guys that, that was always sickly. Um, did join the war uh, for three months, the Civil War, um, uh, for the North, of course. Uh, two of his brothers uh, joined it. And were more serious about it and in it for longer. In fact, I think Wilkie died. Uh, so one of them, I think, died in, in battle. Um, um, he's the oldest of the family. His second brother uh, was Henry. And if you're familiar with any of Henry uh, Henry James's novels. Um, I doubt it, though. Are you familiar with any, read any of his novels? Mm, didn't think so. Um, he writes, in fact, this is a great quote, uh, that while William James was such a clear writer and popularized philosophy, he wrote philosophy as if it were a novel, whereas Henry James wrote novels as if they were philosophy. <laughs> so that explains why some of his novels are not quite that popular. Washington Square, I guess, is one of the most famous. The Turn of the Screw is a scary one. I don't know if you're, if you read them, you would have known who Henry James was. I thought it was interesting that when I was at um, uh, uh, the um, uh, Foreign Language Center, DLI, uh, Defense Language Institute, Foreign Language Center, Monterey. My main teacher during most of the course was Gospeja Fuhrman, and at one point, you we know, we get to know them, and, and so at one point I remember asking her who her favorite American novelist was, and right away she said, Genry James, and since the Russians don't have an H, that's Henry James. You know, Henry. They, by the way, they say Gitler for Hitler. Hawaii uh, for Hawaii. So they don't have a W either. So Gawaii. 
Um, it was an interesting woman. In any case, um, so Henry James um, wrote very deep uh, um, ph uh, philosophical novels about uh, the character. You know, the characters were the whole thing. Um, it's a deep. Turn of the screw, um, Washington Square, those are two that are. However, huge, you know, big, deep, the kind that you read for a long time. However, but William wrote in a way that was much more interesting. Uh, still popular. In fact, if you go to Barnes and Ignobles, you will find at least the varieties of the religious experience on the shelf, new for your purchase. Which, by the way, would be dumb uh, because you, he's, he's long dead now, so this is past the copyright period. And of course, he was writing in English, so it's not like you're getting translations. And so there's uh, tons of copies of his works, all of them, I would imagine, on the web for free. So if you're interested in James, um, and some of some of the uh, the things are really quite still popular. I mentioned uh, um, uh, the varieties of the religious experience, but. I was reading some of these the other day. And so, for example, this one. So, this was written in February 2018, which is like this year, right? Uh, and notice uh, what William James got right about consciousness. They, they keep showing that same picture of him because that's the way he looked when he was born. So that's, people back in the in those days were born already old, I guess. Uh, but so this author is talking about instinct in a, an article that he, that William James wrote 125 years ago, uh, a landmark article simply titled "What is an Instinct." waste no time in defining the concept. Instinct is usually, def so this is James. Instinct is usually defined as the faculty of acting in such a way as to produce certain ends without foresight of the ends and without previous education in the performance. Instincts are the functional correlatives of structure. With the presence of a certain organ goes, one may say, almost always a native aptitude for its use. Has the bird a gland for the secretion of oil? She knows instinctively how to press the oil from the gland and apply it to the feather. So instincts. Uh, as, as you read the article, it continues on to talk about how in his psychology, he put all this together so that if you have all these different instincts for all these different aspects of the brain, etc., uh, and the body, and then you figure the organism has an instinct for how to put all of it together, that an awful lot of our behaviors are all determined by our instincts associated with our evolution, uh, associated with uh, our, our, you know, our biology and our organs as they evolved. You know, so, so in a sense, he's taken Darwin uh, and applying it to the individual organs and parts of us, right? You know, that all these different because you know, if you, you think of it, as you study animals, and he did, he studied them with Louis Agassiz, who I'm guessing you never heard of before either. No. So Louis
Louis Agassiz uh, was from Switzerland. I'm going to call him Swiss American, not because his parents were mixed, uh, but because he spent so much time teaching at Harvard, uh, not because he was, you know, mixed. He was from Switzerland. Um, uh, but he was a huge guy, by the way. He had a lot of trouble when he died. It took a lot of people to carry his coffin because he was so huge. Um, uh, but he was a, a very popular professor and speaker. Uh, and in fact, uh, Harvard campus has a building named in his honor and the labs that are like where the various bones and things, you know, like, you know, when you see the, the bones of animals and stuff, you know, that's, that was his specialty. Um, uh, and he also took students to the Amazon on tours. That was kind of like a Harvard thing. Uh, so William James, as one of his students, went uh, to the Amazon. And it was kind of, kind of interesting that um, one of William James's students, once he became a teacher there in physiology and psychology and philosophy, uh, was Theodore Roosevelt. Just throw that out there. By the way, Theodore Roosevelt went on a tour of the Amazon. And that's when he famously hurt his back, which you know, transformed his life, etc. Just, just a little tidbit, throw it out. Um, so it's just kind of interesting how the Amazon has this, like, that's the, that's the tour that the Harvard grads go on you know, when they're, they're studying one of their you know, summers or something. Um, Agassiz has had a specific reason why he was going through the Amazon. He was against evolution and believed that <coughs> if the world had had an ice age, God would have given the entire world the ice age, not just parts of it. What was his reasoning for that? I don't really understand it. But in any case, he was absolutely convinced that he was looking for evidence of glaciers in the Amazon. And he thinks he found some evidence for it. William James, who was there with him, eh, I don't think so. You know, so, so it's just kind of interesting. So it's one of those, I guess, the prejudice he had led him to find what mm, probably wasn't, as far as I know, the Amazon has had no glaciers. Um, in any case, um, so he, he definitely had a, an impact on James and plenty of others there, uh, and, and still uh, does today. And, and by the way, there's, there's not, uh, not novels, but um, biographies of him, if you're interested. Um, and his resistance to Darwinian evolution and scientific racism, uh, polygenism, Pretty interesting. You know, if you get into that stuff and you see why an awful lot of the weird things that folks believed were kind of science at the time. Uh, if you think about it, the um, idea of uh, uh, racism and uh, um, uh, oh, what's it called? Eugenics. Okay. Eugenics. Actually, is ten, tends to be more of a British American idea. They were both British and Americans that were involved in thinking that way, uh, and then you tie that into folks like um, uh, Reverend Thomas Malthus. I'm not. Sure. I don't think I've mentioned Malthus yet, right? Malthus is very important. In fact, this is where we get the expression Malthusian. You ever heard that? He's Malthusian. Okay, so, so Malthus believed that nature, uh, um, by, by the way, he's one of the ones that inspired Darwin. Notice he's older than Darwin. Uh, his 1798 book, an essay on the principle of population. Malthus observed that an increase in a nation's food production improved the well-being of the populace, but 
The improvement was temporary because it led to population growth, which in turn restored the original per capita production level. In other words, mankind had a propensity to utilize abundance for population growth rather than for maintaining a high standard of living, etc. Uh, and so you end up in a Malthusian trap for uh, the, the uh, you know, and that what happens is you end up uh, with a susceptibility to famine, disease, and war, and catastrophe, uh, and that knocks the population back down again, and then you start the process again, where you start now, oh, now we've got plenty of food to eat. You know, so you, you go through these cycles, right? Uh, it's just very basic because it's based on how uh, humans tend to uh, give birth. Uh, each generation they can have, I, I, just in my lifetime, for example, uh, we went from barely one billion people to now we've got, what, eight billion people, something like that. It's just one lifetime, right? So if we're left to our own devices and we've got plenty to eat, boom, we're as dumb as yogurt, you know? Because you know, yogurt, you know how yogurt, you, you put it in a culture and yogurt will th then, you know, grow and each, each growth, of course, <coughs> toxifies its environment until the toxins kill it, and then we eat it because it's delicious, right? You know, so tox so yogurt's pretty dumb. It uses up all of its resources growing, and then kills itself because it does that. So if you think of what the human beings on the earth seem to be doing, we, we're just as dumb as yogurt. It's not my fault. That's just an observation. You know, we're, we're as dumb as yogurt. However, um, what typically happens, though, is after the population grows to a certain point, Malthus figured it would be cut back naturally by famine, disease, plagues, wars, etc., starvation, right, all that stuff. Uh, and then once the population was down again, it would start again. And by the way, this theory had political implications for the British because everyone believed him in Britain. And then when the Irish had the potato famine, they figured, oh, well, that's just nature. So even though the British landlords actually had food, they continued to sell the food to make profit rather than use it to feed the poor in Ireland. They just let them all starve to death. And as far as they were concerned, it was just God and nature taking its course. You know, it's mm. not our fault. It's right? not a good. And by the way, that's still the theory. You know, when you see populations uh, uh, have have used up all their resources and they're they're dying of famine, you know, while you've got some people that feel like, oh, we've got to feed them. It's an emergency. Let's send shipments of MREs and, and stuff. And you've got other people that say, well, it's their own fault that they've outgrown their own resources, you know, it's, right? You know, so, so the one point of view is a Malthusian point of view. Um, and of course, that, that also uh, in, introduces the concept of, uh, in evolution, of, of a um, uh, competition between groups of people, right? so that you have races, uh, you know, it was pretty obvious to the Europeans at the time uh, that uh, there were different differences between people and that that could be associated with races, especially with Jews, I, you know, gosh, you know, here we go again, you know, this, you know, the 11 people just murdered in Pittsburgh, you know, why on earth did that guy hate Jews? I just want to kill Jews, he said. That's just absolutely, outrageous and weird. Why, you know, why is that? By the way, there was an interesting article in the Washington Post about um, Trump, uh, and that Trump is an anti-Semite without Jews. Uh, this is puzzling because, you know, his son-in-law is Jewish, and Ivanka has converted so that his, he's got Jewish children, basically. Right? Uh, um, not ethnically, but but religiously, um, and Trump himself says that he's 
not an anti-Semite, that he, he loves the Jewish people. In fact, I'm sure he's done lots of business with them, supports Israel. I mean, he's the one that moved the capital to Jerusalem. Yes. Right? Yes. You, know, uh, you know, so but, so what's the point of the article? The, the writer ar argued, but despite all of his actual actions, his speech implies the kind of hatred that leads to anti-Semitism, which, you know, he's a contradiction in that sense. He doesn't realize that he himself, and the things he says, inspires people to hate other people, right? Uh, and I'll think about that. He's reaching. Pardon? He's reaching. Yeah, so that's kind of interesting. I'm not sure that we could blame Trump for any of that, of course. Um, but you could see those articles being dashed about in the papers and so on. But when you look at our actual history, our immigration laws restricted the immigration of people from our the, the people that we they didn't like and darker skin. They liked the northern Europeans. They didn't like the southern Europeans. Um, I was kind of amazed in reading uh, the biography of Oppenheim, Oppenheimer, Oppenheimer, uh, the Jewish physicist who was the head Dr. Atomic, right? Yes, Dr. Atomic was actually an opera, Dr. Atomic. He's interesting. Pardon? He's interesting. Yeah, um, I don't know if this is supposed to be Oppenheimer or one of the other physicists. Opera is about the project that, of course, created the atomic bomb and then performs the first atomic test in the desert. And I guess this is it. And you know, they didn't know. They thought this might actually destroy the world. Yeah. Imagine their emotions as they were setting this explosion off and thinking that it could be the end of the. It is a modern opera, of course, and as a result, the music doesn't sound like music. That noise, you know, that has an emotional. singing in English though, it's an English opera. Subtitles. The subtitles are not. Um, so Oppenheimer, pretty interesting. Um, when his family first migrated to New York, uh, they were pissed off because even though they were wealthy, the wealthy elite didn't like Jews, so they weren't easily merged into the elite organizations and clubs and stuff, uh, but instead the wealthy Jews that had moved to New York, who were Northern Europeans, uh, uh, then became their own elite club, right? And then later another immigration of Eastern European Jews uh, who came in, uh, the Jews that were already there hated those. <laughs> so, it's, so there were Jews that actually hated Eastern European Jews because they were slovenly, filthy, had bad habits, they weren't educated, you know, it's, you know they were kulaks, you know, farmers, you know, 
et cetera. Um, you get the idea. So, so uh, it's not really racial, it's class. I, I would argue it's Classes. class. Yeah. Um, uh, in fact, I, I, I would argue that all my life I've not really been a racist, but I've been classist. So I like people that like the things that I like, no matter what they look. Although, of course, if they like the things that I like, they tend to look yeah. the way you do when you read a lot of books and like classical music, and <laughs> you know, which means you're fat and ugly usually. But you know, that's you know not necessary. But. However, uh, so so a lot of that race race uh, and eugenics, the idea that well, wow, with evolution as a theory, we can apply that now and uh, grow better people, right? So don't let people that have mental illnesses mate and have children. Don't let uh, um, you know, the you know, people mix the races, try to keep pure race, et cetera, right? All of that is actually an American idea that spread to Germany and Hitler was reading translations of American books about it uh, that inspired him to think that way too. So it's kind of interesting that it went that way instead of, you know. And even during World War II, there was an awful lot of emphasis on not having people emigrating to the United States to get away from it. They were actually perfectly fine with them being destroyed over there. It's horrible to think that way, but you know we've got that seed embedded in us too, and it's philosophical. So, um, when, you, when you think Louis Agassiz's his impact on uh, James, and not just James, but others, of course, because he was very popular. Agassiz, Louis Agassiz. Um, so pragmatism is the philosophy that we associate with it, and it's very psychologically based in the sense that um, James did most of his studies in Germany in medicine uh, and psychology, and when he brought them back, by the way, this is also when electricity has been invented and available for use. And James uses a laboratory and famously is the psychologist that brought psychology out of the armchair and into the laboratory. So prior to James, the, all the psychology that's done is by people sitting there thinking about what, how thinking works, right? So there's no actual pulling switches to see what results you get. But with electricity, James has electricity to zap people, and he discovers in his laboratory that if you zap them, their personality changes. It does things. And so he concluded that the mind is electrical, which it certainly, of course, is to some extent. You have electrical waves and stuff uh, uh, that he was manipulating, and yes, he would electrify some people pretty far. I, I think, think of John Nash as one example when he was at Princeton and had his breakdown. One of the things they did to him, and this is in the 50s, was they basically gave him electric shock therapy uh, to try to help him. Uh, it's absolutely terrible, as you can imagine. Um, I, in fact, it's not really completely gone. Isn't it? Don't we still use electric shock yeah. therapy yeah. to some extent? Uh, um, it's strange. I mean, does, uh, so. does it work at all? I, I, I mean, I it, the idea is it's more humane now. Like you're like numb and it's like you'll be asleep, but like it's to rewrite the virus. Yeah. 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 No one thinks we can pull this off. Let's go. We also already know our the 16th. So this is insulin shock therapy. And that was in the 60s, not the 50s. 
This is just a scene from the movie. What is this? Uh, Beautiful Mind, John Nash. One flew over the cuckoo's nest. Oh, that's the one you were thinking of. <laughs> It's just torture, actually. I'm sure if you torture people, you're going to have them change their mood, etc. But he did have psychotic experiences. I don't know if you ever get to see the movie. It is pretty interesting, although uh, it's also fake. Ron Howard, the producer, changed the book, changed the actual life experience of John Nash. That was his wife, by the way, um, in order uh, to make it a better movie. So that's kind of. Where, in the case of Hollywood, reality just wasn't quite as so. <laughs> Yeah. So there is some more that's, drama. Let's add some more drama, et cetera. Okay. So James is pretty important with regard to psychology. In fact, a lot of people will have written that the most important books about pragmatism were James's books on psychology, uh, the principles of psychology being one of them. So I, I'm pretty sure you wouldn't read it today uh, with the mind of understanding psychology today. Although, as you saw with that one article, uh, the author was pretty impressed with um, what James got right about consciousness, et cetera. So, so yeah, there's still opportunities for you to read James and write articles and become uh, this this is uh, a professor at G Gazang Gonzaga. Gun Gonzaga. Wait a minute. Maybe I'm confusing the. I think that's the. That's the author's name. Rather than because there there was something I read the other day that was by a professor. Um, Okay, so that's not him. I can see why I might have confused you. Though. Ah, there we go. So this article in the encyclopedia was written by a professor who is from Gonzaga. Which, by the way, I know I had to look that up. It's near Spokane. Jesuit. So that's pretty interesting. As you can tell, I never get distracted in my reviews of things for. Okay. So. Um, so, what is pragmatism? It actually is just practical. Pragmatism, by another name, uh, is practical. Um, uh, it comes from the Greek. Pragma, meaning what has been done. Um, in fact, I have notes, of course. Um, I'm drawn to those. Last notes. Here I have so, so this is an American outburst. During the late 19th century and early 20th, there was an outburst and flourishing of philosophic activity in America. The key figures drew upon a variety of European orientations. By the way, this whole paragraph I plagiarized from uh, a book. Uh, um, uh, gosh, and I didn't say it? <laughs> That's terrible. Um, but it's from... Uh, the philosophical the 
the metaphysical club by um, this book won Lewis Gamon. He's written other things too, of course, but he's he won. My copy has like a gold seal on it because it won a Pulitzer or something, you know, on the cover. Um, so Louis Menon, that's about a, a real philosophical club that was headquartered at Harvard uh, that included Charles Sanders Peirce, William James, Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr., and a few others. And this book is about those three plus John Dewey, who was not a part of that club. Uh, John Dewey uh, um, was the latest of the, the, those considered uh, pragmatists of that main group. I mean, we're pragmatists today. We might be called neo-pragmatists, which is just to say, well, we're not living in 1870 today, so we must be neo, right? Um, but we're pragmatists, that's, that's kind of the philosophy of America is pragmatism. Um, and these, of course, are the folks that get it started. Um, and despite James's constant <coughs> criticism, I don't know if you've read uh, stuff that James wrote, James was constantly criticizing Germanic idealism. Uh, especially Kant and Hegel, especially Hegel. Remember, he studied in Germany, uh, and so he would have definitely been aware of the uh, German currents in philosophy. And they were Hegelians, uh, for sure. Um, and uh, what he was against was this concept of the absolute, that Hegel uh, you know, equated God with the absolute. Um, James didn't understand that as possible. Uh, James's conception of truth was that truth was what works. And that could change. As circumstances change, what works might have to change. And that indicates the truth is not constant, but evolving itself. Right? So once you have the, this idea of truth evolving, notice that you don't have uh, truth as, as constant. Uh, and so the idea is that uh, um, more Kant than Hegel, but, um, you know, and, and how, do I, how do I explain this difference? I would argue that um, uh, when you look at uh, the universe as a whole, and Einstein does this, Einstein is Kantian, uh, and you know, views the universe right as as this um, right, there's your your whole universe your whole universe your whole universe you, you each have your own but it's complete it's there throughout all time and space just because you're here at the moment, you're always there. You know, and that's because of the way uh, the speed of light is. Right? Uh, so for Einstein, all of time and space exists at once. I would argue that that's actually what Hegel means. So James is not looking at the whole thing. He's looking at time as it's evolving. And I think that's the reason why he doesn't feel Hegel's point of view is acceptable. Um, that's that's me. I don't know. Uh, and by the way, there's also another author that I really like, and that's Walter Kaufman, uh, who wrote about James and argued that Walter. American? German, I guess, originally. Mm. Um, uh, translated lots of books. My, the, you know, the, uh, some of the translations of Hegel that I've read were his. Um, and 
his books about them and that time period I found quite important. Um, and he's the one that argues that William James's point of view is actually criticizing philosophers that Hegel criticized. So, so he's actually more in agreement with Hegel uh, than not. Uh, and so when I, I argue that James is, is actually more in tune with Hegelianism than he says, I have a source uh, for saying that, who's way more important than, you know, I'm just reporting on Walter Kaufman. Um, but so that's why I argue that if you look at Hegelianism, that's too big a word, isn't it? I should have just wrote H, right? And then you think in Europe you've got Marxism uh, and you've got Kierkegaard or existentialism, right? You know that, and this is communism, of course. That over there. This is the way I see it, as I've already suggested, right? That um, the pragmatists really are uh, uh, the continuation of Hegel's philosophy. Um, so, 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 and, and Hegel actually even predicted that, you know, uh, but that. So these folks take just one side of the, the dialectic and, and have trouble, become depressed. You know, you know, the typical smoking cafe, sitting, you know, Sartre uh, or Camus, you know, sitting in Paris, commiserating with one another about you know, the meaning of life, uh, having no luck in getting out of that trap. Right, you know, those are those are the one side. The other side are the communists that feel like you know that you know, we're not individuals; we're all part of a, a great big mass of a class. Right, you know that. You know, both are true, but not in isolation from one another. Right, you know, so that's the problem they have. We accept both that I am an individual. And by the way, James argues that the first step I have to take in order to have a free will is to believe that I have a free will. And that's the title of one of his books, The Will to Believe. Right? You've got to start off by believing you can. <laughs> you know? uh, so, so that's kind of important. You know, whether you, and, and he was depressed and went through a depression himself because of all the science he studied especially studying it in Germany and everything, he came back feeling like it's so depressing. We're all just a bunch of intuitions responding to our natural uh, you know, uh, behaviors that we've evolved into. And as a result, you know, it's like, eh, this life is just sucky, right? You know, period. Um, well, guess what? Um, he got out of that by reading some stuff that we don't read today but he got out of it and realized that you know you have to uh, believe in yourself and have free will. And that kind of recovered him, and that's what got him out of the sick bed and back into teaching. And he spent like a third of a, a century teaching at Harvard, and then started gallivanting all over the country to California, uh, Columbia, uh, uh, Columbia University used to be King's University, New York, right there, and right, Columbia University. Yes? It was King's one? It was King's, the Civil, the Revolutionary War. Okay, that That's where awesome. Alexander Hamilton went, that was King's okay. College. I was wondering if that's what changed it. Pardon? So I was wondering if that's what changed it, the name. Right. King's not her right. Or after. Right, right. Yeah, they, they didn't want to keep the name Kings after he's, you know, oh, right. They were also a Tory campus, whereas Princeton was the Whig campus. So that's kind of interesting too. Um, yeah, all, all the students from Princeton were Whigs, and the ones, Alexander Hamilton, 
if you think about it, you know, he was uh, a federalist. I mean, he was more for authority. So there's Tory influences there yeah. uh, in, in his, um, his interests. Um, okay, so let me go to Charles Sanders first because where I stole it from, Louis Menon. Okay, so during the late 19th century and early 20th century, there was an outburst and flourishing of philosophic activity in America. The key figures drew upon a variety of European orientations, British empiricism, Kant, Hegel, but an important group emerged which included Charles Sanders Peirce. That's how you, you say it, by the way. I, Always saying there's no correct pronunciation of any way because that's a joke. Because if you talk the way I did when I grew up, you know, none of this is the way it is. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but that's true. We, we make things up. Are you from Pennsylvania? Yeah. You yeah. don't want to have accents? Pennsylvania? Not anymore. But back when we had Rocky. Hamburger, cheeseburger. Wit or without, you know. Yeah, cheese please. <laughs> I'm sure it's really just a, you know, I, whenever I do that, my wife, who was from, Phil I was from Delaware County, she was from Philadelphia, she looks at me and says, we don't talk like that. <laughs> but we do both say wooda. Wooda, 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 wooda. Yeah, well, we, we order, I'll just have wooda and lemon, and they look at us like, we don't have that, because they don't know what we said. I have to go through water. Water? Water. Water. I'm sure you have to be part of a Everybody in Minnesota says, we don't talk like that. Okay, so. Kids talk like that, so. So, Charles Sanders Peirce, that is the correct pronunciation of his name, it's not Pierce. So Charles Sanders Peirce, William James, John Dewey, and George Herbert Mead. Notice uh, in the Louis Menon book, uh, he is talking uh, about uh, uh, Peirce, James, Dewey, and Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr. Uh, um, or does he talk about Mead? I forget. Maybe, I forget. Um, but in any case, um, George Herbert Mead was a, a colleague of John Dewey in uh, um, the University of Chicago. And we'll talk more about that next class. So I'm not going to go all the way up to John Dewey today. Uh, but so, although there were sharp differences in their intellectual backgrounds, philosophic temperaments, training, and interests, nevertheless, there were also sufficient family resemblances, which is actually a Wittgenstein term, uh, so that they, as well as others, began to think of themselves as constituting a distinctive philosophic movement. William James, a gifted stylist and an immensely popular lecturer, labeled the movement pragmatism and acknowledged Peirce as its founder. Sometimes it is said that pragmatism was born from James's misunderstanding of Peirce Peirce was so outraged, not really. Peirce, Peirce survived because James gave him money, because he otherwise was drunk and sitting in his house in Pennsylvania all alone. Well, actually he had a French wife, which was why he was drunk and all alone. Well, let's, let's not go there yet. Um, Peirce was so outraged by James's popularization that he renamed his own doctrine, pragmaticism, a name ugly enough to be safe from kidnappers. It's more hilarious than anything else. So, uh, pragmatism, pragma, that which has been done, uh, similar to the Latin res for thing. 
Kant uh, used it as a relation to some definite human purpose. And in fact, Kant used pragmatism in the title of, I think, his very first book, A Pragmatic uh, Anthropology. Which is interesting. That was before he was influenced by David Hume and had his revolutionary okay, So ideas. Kant was influenced by Peirce in that sense? No. Kant was before Peirce. Okay, that's what I thought. How did Peirce would be influenced by Kant. But I'm looking at the word pragmatism and where it came from. Okay. So we wouldn't call Kant a pragmatist. Okay, that's what I was confused on. But the word wasn't invented by the pragmatists. Okay. They, they took it from they it. historical use. Right. Um, so Peirce... And he uses it, how knowledge is related to human action. And Peirce's foundation was a behavioral semiotic or a theory of signs. So for Peirce, pragmatism was associated with a theory of language, how the signs worked. Uh, and, and basically taking it in a very, uh, what we would call linguistics today. Uh, to figure out what the meaning of a word is, what you've got to do is sit down and take notes and watch how people use it in context. And that's where you're going to get the meaning from. Um, so, in the, the theory of signs, the semiotic, and by the way, there's uh, uh, a whole science, that's a whole field in itself today. Uh, there's, we have journals. I, I, I'm pretty sure that the journals we get on the semiotic are no longer subscribe to uh, because of the budget. But you could go and find the old ones up until you know, a few years ago. Uh, we have those still. Sorry about that. Um, so you can't, can't expect to be able to keep up with the current arguments in our journals. However, once we get more money, I don't know how that's going to happen. Meaning, logic, rhetoric, the pragmatic maxim is meaning is the connection between action and experience. So think practical. Uh, James will transform this a little bit to a theory of knowledge, and that's what pissed off Charles Sanders Peirce. Um, let me show you some stuff about Peirce. Uh, um, so Peirce, uh, his father was a mathematician at Harvard, taught mathematics. So Peirce was you know, a spoiled brat of a faculty member at Harvard growing up. Um, James, on the other hand, of course, his family were already rich uh, and traveled all over the place. So uh, James wanted to study art. So they moved to an artist uh, to study art. He gave up after a year. He wanted to do something else. So they moved somewhere else. Uh, so uh, when he, you know, got his job teaching, or he was studying at Harvard, they moved to Cambridge. You know, when, when you know, they, you know, he was studying at, at Lawrence Institute, they went to Boston. You know, so the family basically just moved wherever it would be convenient for their oldest son to do whatever he wanted to do. Um, wanted to study art, they went to Europe, and they visited museums, took their, their kids to different schools, uh, you know, this, turns out that none of the schools really were up to what they had heard, so they could just kept moving every couple of months from one school to the next. Uh, I guess when you have that kind of money, you know, you, you can do that sort of thing. You know, you might you know, have an office in the White House, but, you know, if, if you want to, you want to keep your kid in school in New York, you know, then the wife stays in New York until they graduate. Oh, wait, that's Trump. I'm sorry. That's not Trump. Well, as its privileges, I suppose. Um, but Charles Sanders Peirce goes to Lawrence Institute. Um, every, all of his graduations are summa cum laude, so he's brilliant. Um, uh, and then the war started, and his father was the head of the National Geodetic Survey. Is that right? And what they were doing was mapping the area around Washington, D.C. in order to 
supply the military with maps so that they could defend the city against the expected attack from the Confederates, right? Um, and Dad was in charge of that project, but Charles went with him and was working on that uh, as well. So he was doing mapping. Uh, later on, he spent time studying the speed of light at the Lawrence Institute. By the way, he's also, uh, James by then had gotten married and was a professor at Harvard, and that's when they had the metaphysical club at Harvard. Uh, and that's where Hearst and James become familiar with one another. And that's when Hearst delivers a paper that inspires James, and they, they begin pragmatism. So, so that's so. Hearst first, then James right away. Uh, and by the way, then when uh, Hearst graduates, he heads south to a new school in Maryland near Baltimore, John Hopkins University, and he is teaching logic there. Uh, and that's when John Dewey, who graduates from Vermont College, uh, goes down to John Hopkins to study philosophy. Uh, and by the way, everyone tells John Dewey that's being dumb. And the only colleges that hire uh, philosophy professors uh, hire ministers who are philosophy professors. You're not going to get a job just in philosophy. And by the way, Dewey proved them wrong because as soon as he graduated, he got teaching jobs and never was out of work teaching philosophy. Uh, because the United States' universities became more secular, coincidentally, with his career, et cetera. So uh, that, and look, today you, most of the universities don't have seminaries. Even philosophy departments usually don't have philosophy of religion or religion departments. Those are usually separate or maybe not even in the, in the school. Um, we, for example, have philosophy of religion courses or like Western religion or Eastern religion. Those are the two that we've done. Um, by the way, our, that teacher that we had for that retired was supposed to get a new one who was supposed to be a PhD in that and as far as I know the funding never showed up so we don't have it so if you're interested in studying religion you have to wait until you get they don't have any teachers for religion at the moment at the moment well I mean a lot of us can I think fill in but strictly speaking we don't have a PhD in philosophy of religion Kristen Hansen had a PhD in philosophy of religion, but she's retired now. So we don't have someone who does that. It was tough too, by the way, because she had really strict standards. So you know, people that were good students and like would get A's in all their other courses would get C's in her courses. So that was, that was rough. She expected me to like know stuff. Um, how am I doing on time wise? Uh, okay. Seven minutes. Seven whole minutes? I'm doing six now. Okay, so, so he's a teacher at John Hopkins, and he um, uh, um, has an influence then on John Dewey when John Dewey comes down there. Although John Dewey never actually took courses with him, he did sit in on lectures though that. Hearst gave on logic. Uh, and so that's the connection with Dewey through Hearst uh, to become uh, a pragmatist, though, as you'll see, Dewey referred to his philosophy as instrumentalism, arguing that knowledge is an instrument. But he's always lumped in with pragmatists. Um, and he is. I, I mean, it's, it's he just kind of did his own thing within the group, uh, basically. Um, there's a great story in uh, um, James's essays on pragmatism, which, by the way, is considered uh, the, the best book, uh, most popular book on pragmatism, is James' 
book Pragmatism, their essays. I mean, the, the, the book that explains pragmatism the best, they usually say, is his Principles of Psychology. But the most popular book on pragmatism is James's book, Pragmatism. Uh, and one of, and, and he says, what is pragmatism? That's the opening uh, essay. But um, there's one, one point in the essay where he's talking about uh, these guys all sitting around a campfire. And they ended up arguing over this squirrel that was going around the tree. And what their argument was, and so you figure these are drunk guys around a campfire in Michigan, by the way, because they were visiting one of the members, and this is in Michigan. And by the way, who lived in Michigan? Dewey lived in Michigan. Uh, so, so it's pretty clear to me that Dewey is one of the ones at, at this campfire discussion, right? Um, but James and another had walked off into the woods, and as they came back, these guys all around the campfire were arguing about the squirrel who kept going around the tree. Because as the guys would go to look at the squirrel, the squirrel didn't want to be looked at and would go around this way. And so the guys were going around the tree, and the squirrel was going around the tree, right? And so their argument was, who's going around the tree? The, you know, you know, wait, wait a minute, I screwed it up. Who's going around who? The squirrel or the, the men, right? Because the squirrel's going around and the men are going around. So they were arguing about which perspective is the way it's going on, right? And of course, James and I think it was Dewey came down and, and it, Dewey, James famously explains, both are, are true, <laughs> depending on your perspective, you know, so, you know, so so, so when I love bringing up that question about does the earth go around the sun or does the sun go around the earth, both are true. That's a pragmatist, a, a pragmatic theory of truth point of view. You know that you know you've got lots of different contexts. You have to, you know, what's true within a particular context, what's true within a particular symbolic system. Right? You've got truths. They are true. That's sometimes hard for folks to get over. Speaking of which, did you see the van that was flipped over in the ditch over there? No. Just down at the other end? No. Um, that's, don't know who this van that was. How much relation does pragmatism have to stoicism, if any? To stoicism? Yeah. Does it draw anything from stoicism? Yeah, well, of course, um, the educated individuals that would be prag pragmatists would have read, you know, the, the universities, one of their first jobs was teaching you Greek and Latin. And who do you read? Aurelius. Yeah, so you're reading the Stoics, yeah. among others. I just heard the term uh, uh, pragmatic Stoic or something like that before. Yeah. You can even be a Christian Stoic. Augustine is considered yeah. to be a Stoic as well. So. Yeah, well, and that's why when we do a history of philosophy course, the encouragement is for you to remember all these various things because today we are kind of a collection of all of those ideas. Yeah. Put them all together. So I've got to finish. Um, I'll ask, why did Charles Sanders Peirce get kicked out of teaching? I did. got kicked out of John Hopkins. But why? And the rest of his life he basically spent as a drunk scholar sitting in his own house in Pennsylvania, in Arisby, which you can go and visit. Question to your wife, you pronounce his name as Purse instead of Pierce. Purse is how I understand that it's supposed to be.
MS Drum. This house. I've, I've driven by there with my Oculus Rift. That's still there. Looks hot. And it's still there, and it looks just like that. And all windows. It's got a sign, visiting hours. You can like stop in and see. And in the museum, to purchase Charles Sanders. There's nothing else around it, by the way. It's near the Delaware Water Gap. It's a beautiful country. And actually, there's a Walmart about a mile down the street. So it's not totally out in the woods, but it was actually kind of hard to find. I had to click, you know, had the address and literally advance along the road until, oh, there it is! You know, oh. You should play this game called GeoGuessr. Uh, it's like it just drops you somewhere you have to low, figure out where you're at. and you have to, yeah, on that like little mini map, and you see how close you can get. Um, yeah, it's kind of fun. Oh, the there. thing with with Google Earth is that you just have to pull back, and you're and there's the whole world, and you yeah. and you can see where you were. That's the thing. Yeah, it doesn't let you like, zoom out, so you can't. Uh, you're just there. So why did Charles Sanders first get kicked out of his faculty position at John Hopkins? It should be easy to find. I don't know. <laughs> it's a Google search. <laughs> he was. <laughs> why did he get kicked out? <laughs> he was standing next to her, actually. Oh, it's a good level of fun. Oh, it's a good level of fun? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay.